Today I'm going over the first section in chapter 5 called The Invitation to the Holy Spirit. Healing is a thought by which two minds perceive their oneness and become glad. This gladness calls to every part of the sonship to rejoice with them and lets God go out into them and through them. Okay, again, he's talking about practicing forgiveness. This gladness he speaks of is the love and light of God. It calls to every part of the sonship because there's only one of us. It calls to us to rejoice with them and lets God go out into them and through them. So when we allow God's love into us and then practice forgiveness by letting it come through us, where we see everyone and everything as spirit, as the love and light of God, this is how we heal. Only the healed mind can experience revelation with lasting effect because revelation is an experience of pure joy. Revelation is what we experience when we allow ourselves to experience God's love. If you do not choose to be wholly joyous, your mind cannot have what it does not choose to be. This is his way of telling us that we have to choose it. We have to choose our thought system in order to experience God's love, in order to experience this joy. Remember that spirit knows no difference between having and being. There is no difference to spirit. There is no lack. There is no separation. There's nothing to have. There's nothing to gain. It's what we already are. The higher mind thinks according to the laws spirit obeys and therefore honors only the laws of God. Our higher mind is our Christ consciousness. That's the part of our mind that is called to this course. It is the part of our mind that honors only the laws of God. To spirit, getting is meaningless and giving is all. Okay, so we cannot translate this into our world where we have to go out and physically give to everyone and we're not supposed to be trying to get anything. What he's talking about does not pertain to that. He's talking about our truth in spirit where getting is meaningless and giving is everything. Because when we give it, we are giving it to ourselves. Having everything, spirit holds everything by giving it and thus creates as the Father created. So again, he's talking about in order for us to receive God's love, we need to also give God's love. And that's by allowing it to come through us. We don't need to do it with our behavior and actions. We need to do it with our mind, with which teacher we are choosing to listen to. When we choose to listen to spirit, we will naturally be doing things within our physical illusory world that would perhaps appear to be giving, kind, loving, things like that. But we don't need to worry about that. We're not concerned with our behavior. We are concerned with our mind and what kinds of thoughts we are thinking and which teacher we identify with, what we believe our world really is. While this kind of thinking is totally alien to having things, even to the lower mind, it is quite comprehensible in connection with ideas. If you share a physical possession, you do divide its ownership. If you share an idea, however, you do not lessen it. All of it is still yours, although all of it has been given away. Further, if the one to whom you give it accepts it as his, he reinforces it in your mind and thus increases it. Okay, so again, he's talking about forgiveness. And he's explaining to us the difference between how we perceive giving in the physical ego world versus spirit world. In the physical ego world, when we give, we therefore have less of whatever it was we just gave, right? If you have six apples and you give two of them away, you only have four. <laughs> you have less of whatever you thought that you had to begin with. But not in spirit world, not in our truth. When we give by seeing correctly with our spiritual sight who and what people are, we are then giving to ourselves. We are giving to the whole. We are waking everyone up at the same time and we lose nothing and gain everything. This is what he's explaining to us. Further, 
If the one to whom you give it accepts it as his, he reinforces it in your mind. So when we see people correctly with spiritual sight, it reinforces that we are also spirit in our mind and thus increases it for everybody. If you can accept the concept that the world is one of ideas, the whole belief in the false association the ego makes between giving and losing is gone. So when we can accept that the world is not these physical specifics that we think it is, and the world is actually ideas, then the whole belief in the false ego system where we think that giving means losing out on something is gone. It disappears. Let us start our process of reawakening with just a few simple concepts. Concept one, thoughts increase by being given away. So the more we give away our thought of knowing that everyone and everything is spirit, then these thoughts are increasing. Next concept, the more who believe in them, the stronger they become. So the more illusory people who believe in these thoughts, the stronger these thoughts become within our one mind. Next concept, everything is an idea. Everything, right? Nothing's really here. It's all an idea. It's all a projection coming from our mind. <laughs> Last concept, how then can giving and losing be associated? So he's trying to help us understand here that giving does not mean losing. Giving actually means gaining. This is the invitation to the Holy Spirit. And now he's about to describe what the Holy Spirit is. I have said already that I can reach up and bring the Holy Spirit down to you, but I can bring him to you only at your own invitation. Okay, so this is why we are the chooser. We have to choose to invite Holy Spirit in, which is our higher mind. Holy Spirit is the voice for God. The Holy Spirit is in your right mind as he was in mine. So when Jesus was here as a man, he could hear Holy Spirit. He listened to that voice and that is how he awakened. The Bible says, in quotes, may the mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, end quote and uses this as a blessing. It is the blessing of the miracle mindedness. It asks that you may think as I thought, joining with me in Christ thinking. So he's simply explaining that when he lived here as a man, he was using Christ thinking. He heard Holy Spirit, he identified with Spirit's thought system, and this is how he awakened. So that's why it is a blessing to say, may the mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, meaning Holy Spirit, meaning hearing our truth and awakening. The Holy Spirit is the only part of the Holy Trinity that has a symbolic function. He is referred to as the healer, the comforter, and the guide. He is also described as something separate, apart from the Father and from the Son. I myself said, in quotes, if I go, I will send you another comforter and he will abide with you, end quote. His symbolic function makes the Holy Spirit difficult to understand because symbolism is open to different interpretations. <laughs> yes, it is. As a man and also one of God's creations, my right thinking, which came from the Holy Spirit or the universal inspiration, taught me first and foremost that this inspiration is for all. I could not have it myself without knowing this. The word know is proper in this context because the Holy Spirit is so close to knowledge that he calls it forth or better allows it to come. I have spoken before of the higher or true perception, which is so near to truth that God himself can flow across the little gap. Knowledge is always ready to flow everywhere, but it cannot oppose. Therefore, you can obstruct it, although you can never lose it. Okay, so first he's explaining to us that the Holy Spirit is symbolic. It is the only part of the Holy Trinity that is symbolic, right? 
because we have an actual parent, you know, it's called father because of our world of duality where we have these two different genders, but we have a parent, God, that's not symbolic. We are the son, or again, that's a duality term, the child of God. That's not symbolic, but what is symbolic is Holy Spirit, the voice for God, because we forgot that we have a parent that is God and that we are the child of God. We forgot that. So we need this symbolic voice of Holy Spirit to keep whispering to us within our dream where we have fallen asleep and forgotten who we are. We need that symbolic voice to reach out to us, to keep whispering to us so that we can hear it, hear its call to us. That's why he's saying here about this universal inspiration, okay? That's just another way of saying this call that we all feel, being called home, and that we are inspired to do that. We are inspired to wake up to our truth. And he's saying that symbolic functions are difficult to understand because symbolism is open to different interpretations, right? So that's why within our dream, we all have these seemingly individual ego lives, these seemingly individual dream stories, right? So we all have our own path, our own curriculum, our own way that Holy Spirit speaks to us to have us awaken because there are so many different interpretations and we do appear to be different individuals who think slightly differently. And that's why this course is never an instruction manual on how to live our lives because there is no one fix for everyone as far as what we are doing in our illusory dream. What is a fix for everyone is knowing our truth, knowing we are spirit, practicing forgiveness, using our spiritual sight to know that. So he's talking about how when he was here as a man, he felt Holy Spirit or the universal inspiration, he also calls it, and that he learned here as a man that it was an inspiration for all, that Holy Spirit was speaking to everyone. And he's telling us that he could not have awakened during his lifetime without knowing this, without knowing the truth that Holy Spirit was telling him. And then he's telling us that the word no is proper in this context because Holy Spirit is so close to knowledge that he calls it forth, okay? Because that's Holy Spirit's job. The reason why he's saying it's okay in this context is because he's told us before that knowledge doesn't exist within our illusory world. There is no knowledge in the ego's thought system. But when we think we're here in this illusory world, but we're hearing the whisper of Holy Spirit and we start to follow that, he's saying that Holy Spirit is so close to knowledge that he calls it forth because real knowledge only exists in God's world and Spirit's world. And we can only really have knowledge when we are identified with Spirit. We can get really close to this knowledge even though we're not fully awakened yet because Holy Spirit is so close to that knowledge. So the more that we identify with Holy Spirit, the closer we are to that knowledge because we are allowing Holy Spirit to call it forth to us. But then he says, or better, allows it to come right? Because it's not outside of us calling forth to us. The first way he explained it, really, he's saying better. A better way to say it is to allow it to come, to just allow, right? We don't want to bring anything in. We want to open up and allow because it's who we really are. Remember, he told us that having and being are the same in spirit's world. So this allowing is allowing ourselves to be who we really are, which is spirit. I have spoken before of the higher or true perception, because remember, we can only perceive within the ego world. We do not have knowledge yet. We are perceiving, and we want to practice perceiving correctly, which means with spiritual sight. And that when we have true perception within our illusory world, we are so near to the truth that God himself can flow across the little gap. That is the purpose of Holy Spirit. He's that bridge. Knowledge is always ready to flow everywhere, but it cannot oppose, okay? So knowledge is ready, waiting to come out and flow everywhere to everyone, but it's not gonna force its way in. It doesn't oppose. It's not in a battle to get to our mind. We have to allow it in. It's our job to choose. Therefore, you can obstruct it, meaning our truth, meaning love, light, joy. We can obstruct it, but you can never lose it, he says because it is who we are, we just forgot. 
The Holy Spirit is the Christ mind, which is aware of the knowledge that lies beyond perception. He came into being with the separation as a protection, inspiring the atonement principle at the same time. Okay, so the Holy Spirit, he's telling us, is the Christ mind. That's how Jesus became Christ. He became the Son of God. He understood who he was. Well, he didn't become it. He allowed himself to become it. He allowed himself to identify with being the child of God, with being Christ. We are all Christ. So that's how he did it in his lifetime. He listened to Holy Spirit, which is Christ mind, and which is aware of the knowledge that lies beyond perception, meaning which is aware of truth. So then he's telling us that Holy Spirit came into being as a protection, right? To protect our truth, to not let us be asleep forever in our dream. Inspiring the atonement principle. Atonement means waking up to our truth at the same time. Meaning he's protecting us and waking us up at the same time. That's Holy Spirit's job, to protect our truth and to wake us up to our truth. Before that, there was no need for healing, for no one was comfortless, right? Because we were all one. We weren't having this nightmare dream. We were at home with God in heaven, which is a state of oneness, of pure love, of pure joy eternally. We were there, so there was no need for healing. The voice of the Holy Spirit is the call to atonement or the restoration of the integrity of the mind. Now that we have a split mind, we do need healing. And the purpose of atonement is to restore the integrity of our mind so it's no longer split, so it's whole. When the atonement is complete and the whole sonship is healed, there will be no call to return. Once our mind is healed, we will be back home in heaven with God, extending love eternally. But what God creates is eternal. The Holy Spirit will remain with the sons of God to bless their creations and keep them in the light of joy. Okay, that's Holy Spirit's job. He remains with us. That's why we can hear his call when we listen. He remains with us. It doesn't have to be a he. You can make it anything you want. And the reason that Holy Spirit is here constantly whispering to us is because he is bringing us the light of joy. God honored even the miscreations of his children because they had made them. Okay, this part is metaphor because God doesn't even know about this world. But what Jesus is trying to help us understand, he's speaking to us like we're children. This is why he uses metaphor from time to time, speaking as if God knows about this world and God has some sort of opinion about this world and that God has any kind of thoughts about this world. It's not true. But he speaks to us in this way because our mind is like the mind of a small child or little baby. At times he comes down to our level to explain it to us the way that we would understand in the world of duality. So he's telling us this little story where God honored even the miscreations, meaning our nightmare dream that we made up, because they had made them, meaning he loves us, and that anything we make he's going to honor. It's not true. It's a metaphor. But he also blessed his children with a way of thinking that could raise their perception so high they could reach almost back to him, meaning Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the mind of the atonement. Again, Holy Spirit is the way we wake up. He represents the state of mind close enough to one-mindedness that transferred to it is at last possible. Again, meaning that Holy Spirit is the bridge that takes us from the ego world to spirit world. In this illusion, when we listen to Holy Spirit, he is representing a state of mind that is close enough to one-mindedness that he transfers it as much as possible. Because in this illusory world, we cannot completely be our real selves or else we wouldn't think that we're still in this illusory world. So that's why he's saying it's close enough to one-mindedness because it's as close as we can get using correct perception within our illusory dream. Perception is not knowledge, but it can be transferred to knowledge or cross over into it. Another way of saying the more we practice perception, the closer that we will get to knowledge. And then when we practice it enough, we can even cross over into knowledge, which means being permanently awakened, just like Jesus did. It might even be more helpful here to use the literal meaning of transferred or carried over 
since the last step is taken by God. So Holy Spirit is the bridge that takes us over to God, but then that very last step is done by God, is what he's telling us as far as being completely enveloped by God's love. The Holy Spirit, the shared inspiration of all the sonship, induces a kind of perception in which many elements are like those in the kingdom of heaven itself. First, he tells us, its universality is perfectly clear and no one who attains it could believe for one instant that sharing it involves anything but gain. Again, he's reminding us that when we see the world with spiritual sight, we are giving to everyone, we are losing nothing, and we are actually gaining. Second, it is incapable of attack and is therefore truly open. This means that although it does not engender knowledge, it does not obstruct it in any way. Okay, so when we perceive correctly, when we are practicing forgiveness within this illusory world, we are open to knowledge, we are getting closer and closer to knowledge, and we are not obstructing knowledge as we are using correct perception again and again and again. And then finally, it points the way beyond the healing that it brings and leads the mind beyond its own integration toward the paths of creation. It is at this point that sufficient quantitative change occurs to produce a real qualitative shift. <laughs> okay, fancy words once again to mean the more that we practice forgiveness, the more we do that, the more we build that muscle of focusing with our mind on the truth, which is choosing spirit's thought system, the more that our mind is pointed towards healing, we're integrating our truth, which leads us towards paths of creation. Remember, creation can only happen with God. And that at this point is when we start to have quantitative and qualitative shift in our lives, in our illusory dream, otherwise known as the happy dream, okay? It's not about what appears to be happening in your dream. It's how you react with, with happiness towards everything in your dream because you know it's not real and you know what is real, which is love, which is light, which is wholeness. So as you continue to know that within your dream, you will make these shifts that he is talking about. And the way that we make those shifts is with our perception. We have to choose. And when are we doing this? In every now moment. We always have another moment to choose. And we should never beat ourselves up or feel guilty when we forget and we choose incorrectly. Don't do that. The more you feel bad about it, the more you are using that guilt to, to keep you grounded in the ego's thought system, to keep you grounded in the illusory dream. You don't want to do that. So be gentle with yourself. Forgive yourself for forgetting. It's okay. And the good news is, is that we always have another now moment to choose again.